From the New York Institute for the Humanities, I'm Robert Boynton. Ian Baruma was born in The Hague to a Dutch-English family. When he was in his 20s, he moved to Tokyo to study Japanese film, and he spent the next few years as a reviewer, translator, and photographer. He began writing for the New York Review of Books in 1985 and became its editor in 2017. His most recent book, A Tokyo Romance, is a memoir about his time in Japan. Ian, thank you for joining us at the New York Institute for Humanities podcast. Pleasure. You've expressed a certain ambivalence towards Japan. You've described it as, quote, a country which, to me, can never be home. I'm never sorry to leave, yet I always yearn to go back. So what first drew you to Japan, and how did this complicated relationship develop? I was studying Chinese uh, in the early 70s for no particular reason, apart from liking the food, and I wanted to do something exotic and that might be useful. But China was then like the other side of the moon. You couldn't really go unless you were part of an official delegation of friends of the the Chinese people. And um, I was not drawn to Maoism or Maoist China. And I saw... um, Japanese, modern Japanese theatre uh, performances in Amsterdam and um, Japanese film by the great masters Kurosawa and Ozu and so on in Amsterdam and London and in Paris at the Cinémathèque. And I was riveted by it uh, in a way that I wasn't by China and um, partly because there was a, a culture that was both very modern, culturally very different from anything that I'd been used to and yet so recognizably human. And um, I suppose a combination of those things uh, attracted me. Now, as to the ambivalence, I suppose it's partly because the fascination of Japan lies precisely in an aspect that is both uh, remarkable and interesting and sometimes disturbing, which is its relatively isolated position. I mean, even more than than Britain, um, the Japanese often revel in their sense of splendid isolation, being different from everybody else. Having a sense of nationhood where ethnicity and culture and nationality overlap, where where foreigners, aliens, gaijin, can be accepted on an individual basis and you can make very close friends. You can marry Japanese, as I've done, but you'll never be regarded as sort of a part of of the society in the way that, um, even if you live there all your your life, in the way that you would be, particularly in in the United States of America, but even in European countries. And that makes it fascinating. um, And at the same time, it can be very annoying. Well, the fact that you have part of your uh, heritage is English is interesting to me because the Japanese I know are constantly comparing themselves to England especially today, being a, uh, a former empire, an island nation that was once great and mighty and now is sort of must be deferential to the United States or to China. Do you think that that was another connection, the fact that you have these Anglo roots? Maybe some Japanese do com- like to compare themselves to England or Britain. The more common comparison that Japanese like to make is, is to Germany. Uh, they love the idea of Germany as a country where of science and precision and um, a modernity that in many ways that they emulated in uh, the early 20th century. And uh, the Germans um, before the war, especially in the Nazi period, sort of saw the Japanese as kind of, you know, the samurai nation and the honorary Asians and uh, who were really more white than Asian and so on and so forth. But that made the Germans after the war rather allergic to that comparison, whereas to the Japanese, it's still, many Japanese, it still holds. As far as my own background is concerned, um, if you grew up, uh, especially at a time when it was much less usual than it is now, in a household um, that came from different nationalities, cultures, even religions, in my case, even though my parents, neither of my parents was religious in the slightest, you become very conscious of of difference. You become observant in a way, and you, you become very aware of the different ways that people behave in different cultural contexts. And I suppose that made me into a sort of born cosmopolitan. I had no choice in the matter. I was more than one thing from birth. But it made me very interested in a in a culture which, in some ways, represented the opposite, um, which was so, so, which likes to think of itself, in fact, wrongly, but as monoethnic and and unique and and so on. So, 
I think that was part of the fascination. You come from a family of lapsed Dutch Protestants on your father's side and assimilated Anglo-Jews on your mother's. You've written that this complex mix of influences has left you, quote, half in, half out, never any doubt in my mind that glamour was always somewhere else. The idea that glamour is always somewhere else was more the effect of growing up uh, in The Hague, um, which is, it's not a village, but it's a relatively provincial city. And um, my mother was a Londoner and came from a family of very cultivated um, Anglo-German Jews. My uncle was a film director. There were always actors and musicians and so on. And so I had a very peculiar and rose-tinted spectacle view of England, I thought life with, with my, fa- my mother's family, that that represented England. Of course, it didn't at all. But um, it was certainly more glamorous than the life in The Hague. And so for me, the, the bright lights were always in London. If you do have parents who come from different backgrounds, well, there are various ways of reacting. Um, some people in that situation very consciously, even self-consciously, plump for one or the other and um, rather regressively reject one part of their background, refuse to learn the other language and so on. In some cases, this is encouraged by parents. There was never any question of that in my case. So I embraced both, really. And that means that when um, I'm in Britain, I can pass as British. And when I'm in Holland, I'm Dutch. And uh, but you're always very aware that there is another side of you that is is different. And um, that's not a traumatic experience. Um, it's, in fact, to me, it's always been a source of inspiration. But there is a fine distinction between coming from an English background or a British one. Um, my grandparents were born in London. Their parents were from uh, immigrants from Germany. And I had a relative, a distant relative, who fled the Nazis from Germany in the very early 1930s. And um, he was once complimented on how well he spoke the English language. And he said, I don't speak English, I speak British. And the meaning is actually clear, which is that to be British is a sort of a political identity. It's a national identity. To be English has a more ethnic overtone, which is not to say that my grandparents wouldn't probably have liked to think them think of themselves as, as, uh, as English. How has that, uh, I guess, what would be called today hybridity influenced you as a writer? Well, I wouldn't put myself into this tradition necessarily, nor did I uh, grow grow up in any manner as Jewish. But it's probably not for nothing that journalism has always attracted um, people with, with a Jewish background. One reason in the old days was probably that not all professions were open to Jews. But I think the other reason is that um, anybody who in any way feels slightly on the outside of a society, in the margins, can easily become an observer. And to be an observer uh, is essential to being a good journalist. So rather than being an, an active participant, or you're always watching others. And I think that uh, certainly is true in my case. And again, it's probably less to do with the fact that my mother was from a Jewish family and and more to do with the fact that I I came from a mixed background. The work of the journalist and critic Donald Ritchie introduced a whole generation of readers to Japanese film and culture. But before you traveled from Holland to Japan in the summer of 1974, a man warned you to stay away from what he called the Donald Ritchie crowd. You not only ignored this advice, you adopted Ritchie as your teacher— Why did that man warn you about him? I have no idea to this day. Uh, I think the man who told me that um, was almost undoubtedly gay, and I think there was some uh, social friction between him and Donald Ritchie and his friends. I haven't a clue, really. But I was drawn to Donald Ritchie before I met him uh, through his writing, and I liked his voice. I was very interested in his take on Japanese film, but Japanese culture in general. I liked his style. And so I very much wanted to meet him. It's not so much that I adopted him as my sensei. I mean, in some ways, he adopted me as his pupil, too. Um, and we hit it off instantly and um, never looked back. You, you did this wonderful book of collaboration with him, in which you took these photographs of these extraordinary Japanese tattoos that cover the entire body that are truly living works of art. What did you learn from him in that kind of collaboration and in the, as a student, as it were, uh, over the years you knew him? 
Our backgrounds are very different. Uh, Donald grew up in Lima, Ohio, as a gay boy uh, before the war, when it was must have been a terrible place to grow up as a gay boy. What I learned from him was, in some ways, the importance of, of freedom and inter- individual autonomy. To men of his generation and, and his disposition, coming to Japan in the 40s was an enormous liberation because not only was Japan less beset by the, the Christian sense of, of, of sin regarding um, homosexuality or any kind of sexuality, but um, as a foreigner and especially in those days as an American, you were really exempt from most social obligations and duties and rules that constricted Japanese lives. And so to men of his generation, um, Japan, was they were like kids in a candy store, I think, in the late 40s. But apart from, from that, I think being an outsider, um, even though you can be very warmly received um, on a personal, individual basis by Japanese, but being an outsider also kind of freed a man like Donald because um, he, he always said, I mean, he, he enjoyed being sitting on his perch, observing the society around him of which he could never be a full member. And that gave him a sense of radical autonomy. Again, my situation was different, my experience was different, but I learned a lot about how important it is to be free. I, I recognize that the feeling in the phrase, the radical autonomy that you use in your memoir. How did that radical autonomy manifest itself in your life? How did it uh, free you up, uh, as it were? I suppose it helped me in a process that any young person has to go through wherever they are, which is that in your 20s, you sort of have to figure yourself out and what you're all about, what you want to do, the sense of meaning of your own life, and so on. And being a foreigner in Japan, been surrounded by Japanese, because I had very few Western friends, in a way draws you out of yourself because you have to learn the rules of a culture that's not yours. On the other hand, it also draws you into yourself because it makes you much more self-aware. And so I think I learned a lot about myself by living there, which has relatively little to do with the nature of Japanese culture itself. Japanese culture is embedded in a highly uh, choreographed performances from uh, flower arranging to the tea ceremony or buto dancing and no theater. Now, you grew up in Holland where you learned to see, as uh, you say, cultural behavior as a kind of performance. Is there a connection between that sentiment and what drew you to Japan, particularly as an outsider? Japanese society, even more probably than Britain, is highly ritualized. That's not unique. Every society, uh, every civilized society, has f- has forms and rituals and ceremonies and so on to channel human impulses that if they're left uh, adrift can cause all kinds of damage, um, whether it's sexual or, or forms of violence and so on. And being an old society and a relatively isolated one, uh, the Japanese have developed all kinds of social rules of intercourse that seem strange to outsiders. But again, because I was aware of the nature of conforming to different forms of social behavior. I found it not alienating, but but was constantly fascinated and challenged by it. Well, one form that fascination took, I gather, was a uh, television documentary you made about the training of a elevator operator in Japanese department stores. I have never seen that, but I know that the I've seen the traditional greeters that will greet you to this day in large department stores in Tokyo. What was it that fascinated you about the training of that? Operator. Well, these girls were not only trained to speak in kind of falsetto voices, almost like like male female impersonators in in kabuki, but every movement was kind of choreographed, and they had a machine to teach them the exact um, degree of of the, the proper bow and so on, and so they were, in a way, trained to be dolls or doll like. 
in the way that Kabuki is, because Kabuki began as, as puppet theater, as bunlaku, and the actors, uh, this very stylized way in which the actors move, in some ways is an imitation of, of the puppets. And that goes um, very deep in Japanese culture. In fact, it was Donald Ritchie who once pointed out to me the difference between Japanese television presenters or people who appear in talk shows even in Japan and, and the way it's done in America. In America, people make a show of being informal, slumping in their chair, seeming to be spontaneous. But of course, if you look at an American talk show, it's not spontaneous at all. It's, it's almost as choreographed as uh, shows in Japan are, but it's, it, the choreography is aimed at showing the spontaneity of the individual, which is as fake, as I said, as a more ceremonious performance on Japanese TV. In Japanese TV, and, and indeed in the theater, there's no pretense that it's not theater, that it's not a performance. Of course it is. And you behave in a particular way, in particular circumstances, uh, in, in a way that's required and expected. And that has nothing to do with spontaneity or... Um, your individuality, it's what is expected. And that was very much the case with these elevator girls who were very nice, spontaneous, pleasant individuals in their private life. But as soon as they adopted the role of the elevator girl, they did that with complete gusto. And that seems sort of robotic maybe to an outside, outside observer, but actually it makes perfect sense. Some of the most entertaining parts of your memoir are uh, the recollections you have of participating both in the uh, Buto dancing group and in the experimental theater. Did you ever expect, uh, when you were thinking about going to Japan, that you would yourself become a performer in such a stylized way? Well, first of all, I was I was dabbling in it. Um, I was never serious as a, a Buto dancer or, or an actor. I mean, it was... Um, what the Japanese call itazura, um, for naughtiness. I mean, I was very much on the fringes and I got to know the Buto dance a choreographer and a famous um, Japanese theater director and writer. And they sort of wrote me in their productions as a kind of, almost as a joke. And it was an extraordinary experience, but not, I didn't kid myself that um, I was ever going to be a Japanese dancer or actor. No, of course not. Uh, You made it clear in the book that there was a stunt element in joining these groups. But by traveling and working with them, you developed a unique perspective on how Japanese artists of a certain era actually created their art. Well, my position in these groups was very ambiguous because um, I was adopted as a kind of exotic figure, um, a, a young Westerner in, in Japan who was interested in this world, which was very rare. And so uh, I had a very privileged position. On the one hand, I was a nobody who hadn't achieved anything, but you know, I sat next to the, the director at, at dinners and that kind of thing and was treated as a kind of privileged guest, at the same time, when you go on tour with a group, and this is particularly true in Japan, but certainly not only, because in that period, especially in experimental theater all over the world, including the United States, you had these groups around, which were like rather communal, uh, usually around guru-like figures. So this was a worldwide phenomenon. And if you were part of the group and you were um, on tour, on the one hand, you really had to behave like a member of the group, which I, I was and I wasn't. Again, it was sort of half in and half out situation. And my situation was never made quite explicit or clear because it wasn't clear. And uh, that did lead to uh, frictions. Um, I'm not a great joiner or I'm not very communal, which goes back to your earlier question about what makes a writer or a journalist. I mean, if you're an observer, you don't easily become a, a full member of a communal enterprise. There's a nice moment that illustrates that when you are on the tour bus and uh, you do what most of us would do, you can sort of repair to a back seat and open up a book and uh, they look at you sort of quizzically and say, you really don't know how to travel with Japanese, do you? Uh, yes, to, to sort of peel off and do, do something solitary was, was not, not appreciated. I've always read your collected work as sort of an extended meditation on one question, How do we balance the competing demands of modern identity and traditional culture? Do you agree with that reading? Well, I'm not sure it's the question of tradition and modernity because I'm not never entirely sure what people mean by modernity. 
what does interest me very much is how people see themselves in the context of their nationality, their culture, and so on. And again, that goes back to my own childhood. And of course, that has become one of the issues in, in our age, is in a world of economic globalization, of increased uniformity all over the world. Countries become, on the surface, at least less distinct. It wasn't very long ago that if people went to another country, they'd come back with all kinds of things that you could buy in stores in those countries that you couldn't in your country. That's all over. We now all go to the same stores. And how people regard themselves and their identity and their culture and their sense of belonging and so on in this world that is changing so fast is something that does, of course, interest me. Um, I could say one thing about Japan, which goes back to, I think, your first question about my ambivalence towards the place, which is that one reason there isn't the same kind of right-wing populism, I mean, there is right-wing populism and certainly right-wingery, but the right-wing populism that, that you now see in Europe and the United States is that there are very few immigrants uh, they hardly allow any refugees to come to Japan, uh, although now there are a large number of Chinese students and so on who stay on. It is, a, relatively speaking, a, a homogeneous society. And on the one hand, that's irritating. You think a modern society should be cosmopolitan. Tokyo should be the sort of metropolis of Asia, and it, it, they should la allow refugees in and so on and so forth. On the other hand, it is a society where everything works rather smoothly. And even as a foreigner who knows Japanese, I could sort of understand the feeling. I mean, when you're in a small Japanese bar and talking about Japanese things in Japanese, and suddenly a, a great clunking foreigner comes in, the atmosphere changes and the foreigner doesn't always know how to behave and does embarrassing things. And you could see why many Japanese, conservative Japanese don't really want to let go of the relative homogeneity of their society. On the other hand, one has to sort of condemn it. Well, there seems to be a kind of incommensurability between uh, the broadly speaking sort of liberal modern ideas having to do with human rights and autonomy and the right to travel and certain ways in which minorities and women are treated and the kind of blood-based nationalism that had a stronghold in Germany and Japan before the war and, and, and has echoes of it today. And, and I, in that comparison, I do wonder about the kind of extreme nationalism that inhabits certain forms of extreme jihadism and, and Islamic fundamentalism and the kind of modern notions and wondering about the comparison there. One of the reasons you had extreme nationalism in Japan in the 30s, apart from circumstances like the, the economic slump and all that, was that since the 1860s, the Japanese elite had done everything to mimic the West, um, learn as much as they could from the West in order not to be colonized. And a famous writer, Natsume Soseki, once said that the, the, because of the, they ingested all this too fast, Japan was, would have an, a serious case of indigestion. And in some ways that happened. And so the extreme nationalism of the 30s was a reaction in some ways against that nerve-wracking form of, of, of westernization. Uh, I don't think that, that can be usefully compared to the problems of young Muslims or people from Muslim families who are born in, in Europe or born in the West and can't find their place, um, which is not only um, their fault, it's also because the society around them doesn't accept them often. And so jihadism becomes a way out for people who don't have a sense of meaning of their lives, but also feel a lack of belonging, a lack of acceptance, and they, there they find something to latch on to. So I don't think that that's quite the same thing. What is comparable, I suppose, is that most people need to feel a sense of belonging, a sense of community, a sense of meaning, and that can take toxic forms. So you, you, you have a written about your time in Japan uh, in isolated bits of reportage throughout your career. What made you want to look back over this particular experience and period in your life uh, now? Well, I always wanted to write about that experience, and I never really figured out how to do it. 
and I had fantasies of writing a f- kind of fictional account of it, and nothing really worked until I a method sort of came to me, and that, that was to not to write directly about my own experience, but to hang it up on the two figures who were most important to me in, in those years. And one was Donald Ritchie and the other one was Karajuro, a, a well-known uh, theatre director. And um, by uh, structuring it that way, I can tell my own story, but it would, it, it's, it's, it's often how to, to structure a book and how to tell a story is the hard part. Writing it is, is, is relatively easy. But what makes it hard is that it doesn't come by just sitting in your chair and thinking and scribbling. It, it it just has to come in one way or another. Did you go back to Japan to prepare to write the memoir? Not really, because it was really all about memory. And um, I'd never kept a diary. I never made notes. I never really wrote letters. So it all had to come out of my my head. And that is like writing a novel, because you take things that got stuck in your memory, and then you have to make a coherent story out of it. I always envy sort of obsessive uh, diary makers like Edmund Wilson or Donald Ritchie himself who uh, simply can publish the results of their scribblings over the years rather than recollecting them. Yes. Well, I'm not one of those people, um, and I never will be. I think people who keep diaries, it's the way they are. The most interesting diaries, of course, are, the, are by people who are narcissistic enough to show their worst side too, Diaries which have been cleaned up to make the, the the writer look sort of better in retrospect on the whole are not very interesting to read. Well, you certainly can't be accused of making yourself look better. Uh, one of the main scenes of the book takes place during a performance. At the height of the action, when the lead actress flings herself into your arms, you drop her. That was very conscious because my part, because um, if you describe other people in a more or less comical way, which is to my taste, you have to make yourself into the most comical character. Um, and Otherwise, it, it, it comes across as snide and self-aggrandizing. Well, Ian Baruma, uh, congratulations on your book. Uh, once again, that's uh, Tokyo Romance. And thank you, Ian, for taking the time to talk to us at the New York Institute for Humanities podcast. It was a great pleasure. This podcast has been brought to you by the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU in conjunction with the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. Our producers are Annika Kandinya and Ben Branstein. Our thanks to Uli Baer and, for their technical and design wizardry, Aaron Dowdy and Selena Lacazzi. For more information, or if you'd like to subscribe to our podcast, visit our website at, this is one word, nyihumanities.org.